production support for Spirit of Orange County is provided by Visit French Lick West Baden. Welcoming visitors of all ages to Orange County for activities including outdoor recreation, Indiana artisan wine, and world-renowned hospitality. Information on this and more at visitfrenchlickwestbaden.com and by WTIU members. Thank you. Spirit of Orange County is, is just a close-knit community. I think that's just uh, something you don't get in a lot of areas. When anyone has a problem, everybody comes together and helps each other. It's just a great little community. The people, you know, just the friendliness of the people. And, you know, I love the small towns. So the first thing you notice is the beautiful courthouse, and then you get to know the people around here. That's my favorite thing. Oh, I'd say the spirit of Orange County is definitely the family uh, aspect of this place. Family really matters here a lot more, and the community really has that sense of belonging. I see it in my church every Sunday. I see it every week. Everyone's part of the family if you live here, and that's the cool thing about Orange County. Many of the earliest settlers in this area were Quakers, fleeing the institution of slavery in their former home, Orange County, North Carolina. It took a stand that wasn't terribly popular in their culture. It was a conscience thing that drove them to come here. They wanted to be in a land that was free. And I love that fact that I'm connected to those people that left everything and moved to a wilderness because they knew that here there would be no slavery. And so because they came from Orange County, North Carolina, when the county was formed in 1816, that was how it received its name. But they were really looking for both a religious haven and a place with economic opportunity for them. And in time, they found that in their new home. Today, Orange County, Indiana is home to the farming community of Orleans, the county seat Paoli, the resort towns of French Lick and West Baden, and a number of smaller communities scattered throughout the county. For around 20,000 Hoosiers, Orange County is home. For others, it's the place they go in the winter to ski or to the lake in the summer. But for a lot of folks, Orange County is that place in Southern Indiana where you round a bend and find yourself looking at a building that just doesn't seem like it should be there. Pictures, photographs, having someone tell you about it truly doesn't do it justice. At the time this was built, it was a marvel, and that's what was intended. If you weren't wowing people with what you were doing, building things that were bigger and better and faster and stronger, they felt you weren't doing it justice. And it continues to wow people who come back on a regular basis. You just can't help but pause and ask the question, why here? The story of the valley that becomes the story of two remarkable hotels begins with water and salt. The springs and the licks brought life to the area, specifically the buffalo, and the buffalo brought man to the area, specifically French fur traders. Later on, the French name became attached to that, the French at the licks, and you had French lick. Salt was so plentiful that in the early 1800s, the government set out to mine the valley and it turned out to be something that just wasn't feasible financially, so they sold the land off. William Bowles was able to buy 
the land of French Lake and West Baden in this valley, 1,500 acres at a very, very low price. And that price, about $1.25 an acre, included the springs, which were prevalent throughout the county. The mineral springs here in the Springs Valley were sulfur springs. So the aroma that hung in the air around here was of rotten eggs, which couldn't have tasted too good, but if you had an ailment and you wanted to be cured, you would endure it. And if the public thought they could endure it, Dr. Bowles thought he could sell it. And he began advertising in area newspapers that he had these miracle healing waters and he would deliver them to your door by horse and buggy by the barrel load. Surely that had to be a lot of work. It would be easier if he just let people come to him. And he built the first hotel on that site. He called it the French Lick House in 1845 and started dispensing the waters. People came here to take the water. You could take a train to the nearest town and then you would take a stagecoach the rest of the way to get here. And people who were genuinely ill came to these places because they felt there could be a cure, maybe even a miracle cure. The promise of a miracle brought visitors and visitors brought competition. Soon, Dr. Bowles was convinced by a business partner to sell him a nearly 800 acre plot with a spring of its own. Which happened to be a mile down the road. He opened the Mile Lick Inn. That name was changed to the West Baden Hotel. Competition between the hotels and their rival Miracle Waters continued for decades, and things remained largely status quo until 1901. That year, Tom Taggart and a group of investors bought the French Lick Springs Hotel. It was modernized, expanded, and became more like the hotel we know today. That same year, the West Baden Springs Hotel, now owned by Lee Sinclair, burned. Miraculously, no one was killed, but the hotel was a total loss. Vowing to rebuild, Sinclair declared two things. His property would be 100% fireproof, and his guests would vacation under the world's largest freestanding dome. And he did just that. It opened for guests just a year after the fire and was advertised as the eighth wonder of the world. It was, and still is, a marvel. These new structures and their new owners ushered in a golden era for the valley. 14 trains a day would stop at two depots just to get off for these hotels. If you were here for the cure, your minimum stay was probably an average of 10 to 14 days. But if you were very wealthy, the potential to stay longer was there, and sometimes that averaged closer to two months at a time. This was a destination. The same people who spent time going to Europe on the cruise lines are the same people that came here. They expected the same cuisine that they would find in Europe or New York City. They expected that level of service, and they got it here. This place was extremely upper crust. Both the French Lick and the West Baden Springs Hotel essentially operated as their own little cities. Everything they needed for their operation, everything you needed as a guest was usually available right there at the hotel. Mr. Sinclair at West Baden had what I like to call America's first mini mall. The entire ground floor of the structure was devoted to nothing but shops and services for the guests an aviary, a beauty shop, a barber shop, a haberdashery, a drug store. Even a fortune teller had an office in West Baden. There was exercise, there was fresh air, fine food, and of course the waters. And there were few things, at least according to the experts at the time, that a dose or two of the waters couldn't cure. And while it's unlikely the water cured anyone's chronic gastritis or inflammation of the gallbladder, it did have an effect. The Pluto water had a laxative effect more than anything else. It also contained trace amounts of lithium. A mood elevator, if you will, so we always laugh and say, gosh, it's no wonder those people left here so happy. 
I think this area had two customers. I think they had the customer who was very interested in being cured or the health aspects. And then they had what I call the play customer. There were as many as 13 casinos that operated in this valley from 1895 until 1949, and it wasn't legal. It was viewed as an amenity for the wealthy guests. They would walk across the street and go into the clubs to drop one or two thousand dollars. They could afford to do that, the same way most people would go to the movies and spend eight bucks today. Each hotel basically had a casino that operated on their property, but Taggart and Sinclair were wise enough to know that the legality of it put their whole business in jeopardy was the one area where they worked together very well on. Uh, they spent a lot of money uh, and a good deal of their lifetime refuting charges that they had anything to do with illegal gaming. The stock market crash in 1929 was truly a turning point for West Baden Springs. There was a stock exchange here inside the West Baden Hotel, and the ticker tape machine told the tale. The word of the crash came in, and it was just somber. Within just a few hours, people had packed up and cleared out. It probably became a ghost town overnight, because for most of them, they'd lost everything they had. Years earlier, ownership of the West Baden Springs Hotel passed from Lee Sinclair to his daughter Lillian, and from Lillian to Ed Ballard, a local businessman who had made a fortune in the valley, largely from illegal gaming. The years after the market crash hit Ballard and the hotel hard. He had conventions that were booked here, some of which did still come, so he would just periodically open and close the hotel. Uh, but the regular guests weren't coming and they weren't returning, and he quickly reached the end of his rope. And by 1932, he had locked up the doors. Ballard's decision to sell the West Baden Springs Hotel took it into a different part of its history. He knew that perhaps the hotels would never regain the business that they enjoyed. And, you know, he needed to cut his losses. He sold the property to the Jesuits, a Catholic order of priests, for the sum of one dollar. And they, of course, utilized this as West Baden College, a seminary, for the next 30 years, maintaining it for a period of time when likely few others could have afforded to do so. That allowed the French Lick Hotel to continue on as a hotel because now they had the whole piece of the pie. They survived the Great Depression and established a real presence in the political arena. Taggart's influence continued to lure large political conventions like the 1931 Governor's Conference, where they persuaded FDR to be the Democratic Party's candidate for the presidency, and he would formally accept that nomination a year later in Chicago. During this time, illegal gaming still drew people to the valley, but that too would soon change. In 1946, Tom Taggart Jr. sold the French Lick Springs Hotel, and without the family's political influence active in the State House, in just a few years, casino gambling in the valley was no more. So for the next 10 years, things were pretty darn tough. The hotel did have another owner, and he brought in some business. But it really wasn't until 1955 when the French Lick Hotel became the French Lick Sheraton Hotel and part of that chain. They built a convention business that was truly unrivaled for many years. Businesses like General Motors would come and have their conventions here. That kind of kept the hotel going. That and the bottling of Pluto water was their mainstay for many years. The area transitioned from being a destination that most people knew about in the early 1900s and would travel to for their health or to visit the many casinos in the area to just slowly going downhill. After the, the seminary left, a Northwood Institute established a college campus at West Baden. 
and in 1983, uh, they put the property for sale. A developer said, I'm gonna restore it as a grand resort, uh, but in a year's time filed for bankruptcy. French Lick changed hands many times. Its ownership, often not people who lived in Indiana, convention business declined, and it started to decline also. Orange County ultimately, in the latter part of the 20th century, had one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. Local citizens had spent 20 years trying to lure industry to the area with no success. When the area truly flourished was when the hotels were booming and successful and when casino gaming was here. Well, in uh, 1991, the West Baden Springs Hotel, a National Historic Landmark, was on the watch list for Indiana landmarks. It was in the midst of a bankruptcy. Deterioration was growing, and a wall collapsed on the west side of the building. At that point, Indiana Landmarks did something previously unprecedented for the organization. They came in, invested $200,000 to shore up and stabilize that collapse and create a marketing plan to really begin to promote the plight of this one-of-a-kind piece of architecture. Indiana Landmarks president at the time was a gentleman named J. Reed Williamson. He was acquainted with the Cooks. He knew of their good preservation works in Bloomington and around Indiana, and so he bucked up his courage and made the trip to Bloomington where he sat down with Bill Cook. I think his initial intention was to ask for a million dollars, and he thought that was just way out of the ballpark. Um, but they sat down, and before that meeting was through, on a handshake, uh, Mr. Williamson and Mr. Cook agreed that they would help us rescue West Baden Springs. The proposal was focus just on the building, do about 20% of the total. They estimated that the time frame would take about 30 months and that the cost would be around $12 million. Everything was finished in that 30 month period in October of 98, but at that point the building along with the grounds was about 50% restored at a cost of about 34 million. And at that point, the partially restored property, still owned by Indiana Landmarks, was put on the market. It was a tough sell. What do you do with a place like this? Saving a building is fine, it's well and good, but unless it's lived in or used for something, that building is just a shell. After you save the building, then you have to come up with a way of making that building viable, and make it work, make it part of the community, make it useful. I know over the years, some of the ideas touted were theater in the round, a nursing home, or even an apartment type situation. But its history was a hotel, and it's really a fabulous building, and you want to have that open for everybody. So how can you make it work as a hotel? They finally decided, after crunching the numbers, that the only thing that was going to make this place work was gambling because that's what made it go the first time. By that time, Indiana had created 11 riverboat licenses, primarily for the Ohio River and the Lake Michigan area around Chicago. There was one license, however, granted for Potoka Lake, and it was under the auspices of the Army Corps of Engineers. That was the last license out there, and everyone hoped to be able to move that. So a local contingent formed a group calling themselves the Orange Shirts. They donned orange t-shirts that read Save Our Springs, SOS, and began paying regular visits to the state legislature. They would leave oranges on the desks of every legislator, and it wasn't long before they got their point across. It's kind of an interesting thing because it just took us back to the way things were a uh, hundred years ago, literally. The Cooks, who were never truly proponents of gaming, realized that for West Baden Springs to ever be finished, to become something again, and for French Lick to thrive in the future, it was going to depend on that casino license. So Cook pursued and was granted the gaming license, purchased the French Lick Springs Hotel, and along with his wife Gail and son Carl, began the next phase of what was becoming a massive renovation project.
I always tell the people who come and take our tour, we tell them that it all began with a $12 million promise that today has become an investment of over $560 million in these two historic properties and in these two towns in hopes of creating the destination that this truly was 100 years ago. The people here are down home. They're so caring about their communities, about each other. They're hardworking. They had a grit and a determination to persevere in spite of the odds and hard times, and it has really paid off for them and will continue to pay dividends well into the future. I think everybody in this place responded to the surge of hope that was brought about in the investment of the valley. We have seen and continue to see the results of that gift of Bill and Gail Cook and that vision that they have. Everything is being changed and upgraded and it's bringing a new sense of pride into the people that live in this community as well. It was almost exactly 100 years from the heyday of the hotels the first go around to the rebuilding and Phoenix rising from the ashes of the hotels today. The history of the area and the future of the area is tied, I think, very closely to the two hotels and, and their success. It's meant a lot to this area to have the hotels revitalized again, and people are coming here again. So I think the future is very bright. One of the greatest mysteries that remains about the West Baden Springs Hotel revolves around the angels that are in the drum, which is the center hub of the dome here. They're down on the inside, so you can't really see them. The only way to get there is to go out on the building's roof, scale the side of the dome. You have to drop down through a hole in the floor on a ladder to get inside the drum. But on the inside of that drum are these paintings of angels, larger than life, probably about nine feet tall. Um, and the mystery is, no one knows who put them there. So when you think of angels, a lot of people, the natural assumption was, oh, it had to be those Jesuits that put that there. There's graffiti on them, a lot of it in chalk that probably goes back to the days when the college was here. But at the same time, if you look real closely, you find other graffiti, much smaller and in pencil, dating back to 1917. Could it have been someone that came here with the Cassini Tile Company who laid the mosaic tile floor? Or the Rookwood Pottery Company who did the fireplace? Or the artisans who did the artwork? The circuses that Mr. Ballard owned that wintered here, they had painters that painted the calliopes and the circus sideshow banners. Could they have done it in the winter months when they were just waiting for the circus season to roll around again? We continue to search today uh, for answers to that question. Who knows, maybe one day it will be mystery solved. Until then, we wait. describe Orleans lovingly as a Mayberry um, type of community. We still enjoy our small town rural lifestyle. There's a lot of sense of community pride. Orleans certainly has a number of challenges, but I think as a whole, I still think it's a wonderful place to call home. Orleans really came about because of a gentleman, Samuel Lewis. He and his wife, Sarah, came from Virginia and settled in Orange County about 1810. Lewis was a pioneer looking for new opportunity, new life, and he was pushing his way through the Indiana Territory. 
he arrives here in, in rural Orange County. They decide to uh, found a town. It had almost been exactly two months to the date that Andrew Jackson had had that very decisive victory over the British at New Orleans, which was a huge chapter in our, in our country's history. Uh, Lewis, being a patriot, decided to christen or name his town after that famous uh, event. Today, it's really hard to associate a Little Orleans with uh, anything like a battle, but uh, nonetheless, she was born out of a great victory. And Lewis lays out the streets. He builds the first building here, which was a mill, and later he builds an inn. And he sets aside a series of lots, and he names those lots Congress Square, uh, meaning public place. In time, Congress Square will become a very important part of the formation of the little town, and it's probably the most tangible link we have back to 200 years ago and has become the meeting place, the gathering place 200 years later. At one time, there were 22 passenger trains that stopped in Orleans every single day. Today, we kind of uh, are rivals in basketball, but at that time, we had uh, kind of come to, to blows about the railroad and who would get the first railroad, where it would be Paoli, which had been established as a county seat, or Orleans. Uh, Orleans residents got together and they were able to uh, come up with about $40,000 in subscription money, which was a sizable amount for a small uh, community like Orleans and were victorious in being able to bring the first locomotive here in October of 1851. The railroad brought a lot of good things and it helped the little town to prosper and, and move forward. The Dogwood Festival is really our homecoming. It's one of the first festivals in Orange County. And it really is just a real community celebration of people coming together. And usually uh, at that time of year, we're really kind of done with winter and it's a chance for people to come out and come together. So it's just a wonderful community event that's been taking place for almost 50 years. The vision of the Dogwood really is attributed to a lovely lady who's gone now, uh, Elizabeth uh, Wheeler. Uh, her nickname was Bill to her family and friends. And so she had the vision that dogwoods, because they were native to this part of the state, to have these trees planted along the corridors or coming into town. In time, Elizabeth's ideal kind of took off and other uh, townspeople picked up uh, that ideal. And today, as a result, hundreds and hundreds of the dogwood trees have been planted in, in the yards and, and the parks and along the, the entranceways to the community. In 1970, um, then uh, Governor Ed Whitcomb proclaimed Orleans officially as the dogwood capital of Indiana. And so we enjoy the, the beauty of spring. We still enjoy the beauty of our dogwoods. There's a wonderful event that happens every Saturday on the historic town square where folks gather to uh, enjoy the wonderful produce that is raised here in Orange County and beautiful handcrafted type items. The farmer's market is the result of a group called Orange County Homegrown. And so the market in Orleans has really taken off has been voted as one of the top 10 farmers markets in the Midwest. Buck a Book is a great success and it's been a very popular thing. Kind of a bookmobile that travels where people can go and actually bring books and kind of an exchange uh, program. An outstanding market and it's a great partnership and it brings a lot of visitors, a lot of activity that uh, takes place throughout the summer months in the town square. It's home. I think that really kind of sums up how we feel about this, this special place of ours, is that it's home. It's the sense of community, of coming together, and the wonderful sense of place that we have. 
It's the things that we value and that we uh, embrace uh, to this day in Orleans. And I think that those things are still evident here. I like our geography here. I went to school in Bloomington, Indiana, and there's a place called Brown County, which is quite close to that. And in the fall, people made a trek to Brown County all the time. The leaves were beautiful. It was hills and valleys. When I first moved here in 1980, I said, this place has everything that Brown County has. You can see the most beautiful hillsides, rock outcroppings, color in the trees, or icicles hanging off the rocks in the wintertime. It's one of the special places in southern Indiana, the hills of Orange County. Whether it's fall, summer, spring, it's absolutely gorgeous here. I just can't get enough of being outdoors and uh, experiencing all that it has to offer. And there are a number of sites throughout Orange County where you can enjoy nature and history at the same time. The first of these is Pivot, or Initial Point. This small 18-acre site just outside of Paoli celebrates the surveyors who in 1805, before Indiana was even a state, brought order to the wilderness. The old system is called meets and bounds, and it is atrocious. It uses natural landmarks, trees, rocks, creeks, all of which could move, could change. It was so complex and caused so many boundary disputes that Abraham Lincoln's family actually left Kentucky and came to Indiana. So Thomas Jefferson was put in charge of a committee to set up a new survey system. So in order to do that, they had to set a point to start the survey. There would be a baseline, which would be an east-west line, and then the principal meridian, which would be a north-south line. And from that, all the surveying would take place. When they got to Indiana, they had pretty much perfected the system. Ebenezer Buckingham and some surveyors, they set what is known as the initial point, or what we call pivot point around here, but it is the point at which the survey would begin. It's the crossing point of the baseline and the principal meridian. And from that point, the rest of Indiana was surveyed. When you come in now, you walk down over the hillside and down at the bottom, there is an interpretive sign that tells about the whole history of the initial point. And this cornerstone, which now marks initial point, replacing the original wooden post in 1866. The U.S. Forest Service manages almost 13% of Orange County as part of the much larger Hoosier National Forest. In total, it's nearly 33,000 acres, but it's made up of small scattered pockets of land like this one, which tells the story of a group of Orange County's original settlers. The Quakers in North Carolina were in the process. They had decided that slavery was wrong, as all American Quakers had. But the Quakers in North Carolina had really serious issues with it because the state had very difficult laws for emancipation. And so they didn't want to just sell slaves because then they felt like they were just selling them into the whole institution, but they were also not able to free them. So there was a short window of time where they could bring them to Indiana as a free territory and set them free. There were some free blacks who moved up as well, who had not, they weren't slaves in North Carolina, they would just decide to come and they formed a settlement southeast of Paoli, the Lick Creek Settlement. It was never a town or a village per se. It was just a loosely knit group of farmsteads that kind of got its identity. By the early 1900s, most of the African Americans were gone in that area. And today, little remains of that early settlement. There is a cemetery. We have interpretive signs at both of the trailheads, and then there's a cemetery that you can visit. It's kind of down, it's a little bit off the trail and down over the hill. Just recently, we had several descendants came down. They were having some kind of family reunion in Indianapolis. And they came down, they wanted to all visit the cemetery. Most of them had never been there before, so we went down with them. And it was just, it was really touching. And they brought flowers to put on all the graves. 
So some of them have nice stones, but others just had fieldstone markers. Joseph and Mary Cox came to Indiana in 1816, and they came and they settled in the area that is now Pioneer Mothers. He wanted to preserve some of the trees because at that time that hillside had not been cut and he recognized what huge trees and that there might be value in saving the original old growth trees. So the land remained in the family, the trees largely untouched for three generations. Joseph and Mary's grandson was the final caretaker and upon his death in 1940, the land was put up for bid. And a lumber company got it. The people of Paoli desperately wanted to save the forest. The timber company gave them so much time, if you can raise the money and this time we'll sell you the, the land. Articles about this forest and that, that was probably going to be cut appeared in New York and Washington papers. It was just a huge outcry, we have to save this forest. We came up with half the money and then the Pioneer Mothers Club came up with a very large section. Other donations came in and they, with one day to spare, were able to save the forest. It was purchased with two contingencies. It had to be named Pioneer Mothers Memorial Forest and that the timber could never be cut, which was fine. We had no interest in doing that anyway. So locals typically refer to it as Cox's Woods, whereas it's officially Pioneer Mothers Memorial Forest. People just were always so proud that that was one of the last old growth forests of that size left in the eastern United States, and it is. I mean, there are small pockets, but an 88-acre tract is a pretty large old growth forest. If man doesn't do anything to the forest, this is what one looks like. And there's some extraordinarily beautiful trees in there. You can't get your hands around them, and they go up and up and up and up and up and up. An amazing place. People love it, and that's probably why they saved it. Probably even back in the 40s, it was just a place for people to go enjoy nature. There are a few things that define a community and give it identity. And a school is perhaps the most significant. On any given night uh, during basketball season, the gymnasium would just be full of townspeople who, that's just what you do on Friday nights. You go and you cheer for the home team. There's a thing that really is tied with the identity of these rural communities through their schools. County, we have a little bit of a unique situation, maybe due to our small population, that we still have three school systems here within Orange County. Paoli has by far the largest school district, about twice the size of the other two schools. And there's always been talk about, why don't we just create an Orange County consolidated system? That comes up from time to time and has historically. But that really runs counter to how people feel. And you can just watch in Indiana what has happened to smaller communities when they've lost their school. And I think that's why the towns have fought so hard to maintain those school districts. Today with technology, anything that a student is interested in or would like to be connected to is available to them at their fingertips. Our schools are large enough to offer our students a quality education. And in fact, I would argue that you could be even smaller today with technology and still offer quality education to students. We have great administrators and staff who are, are very much connected with the community and in the lives, the daily life of the community and with our students. It's very easy for a teacher to know a great number of the students and to develop personal relationships with them and interest in them. You know, the student is not lost in the shuffle. You know what's going on with them. If they're having struggles or whatever, you know those things. It also gives the students more opportunities to be in, involved in stuff too, because we need you. <laughs> so we, we'll take you all, you know. Whereas a big school, they probably would specialize in one thing. And so I think we're very blessed to have uh, some wonderful schools here in our area.
how did this town in Southern Indiana get an Italian name? The town is named for a Corsican, Pascale Paoli. The governor of North Carolina, Samuel Ashe, while he was in England, he met Paoli and he was very impressed by him. So he named one of his sons, Paoli Pascale Ashe. This little boy died right before the Quakers moved here. And to commemorate him, they decided to name this town Paoli. Paoli did not exist until Orange County was created. The territory appointed some commissioners to come to Orange County and find a location for the county seat. Most county seats in Indiana are located fairly close to the center of the county as much as possible because they wanted people to be able to get there within a day's travel and be back, able to get back home. So while Paoli was established as the county's center of government, French Lick and West Baden were centers of tourism, an industry deemed by some to be a bit more interesting. I think there was some jealousy and there was an attempt by some Paoli uh, businessmen to create an alternative. And they thought that perhaps because the Monon Railroad came through Paoli before it got to French Lick, that they could siphon off some of the business. So they drilled a well in Paoli to tap into some mineral water, and it was known as the Lithia Well. And they built a hotel on the south side of the square called the Mineral Springs. They started a bottling company. They put a dam across Lick Creek and they created a small lake that they named Lake Waterloo. For a while, they thought they were really gonna be able to do something, but they could never quite compete with the draw down here to the waters and probably to some of the other less savory uh, <laughs> recreation that was occurring in, in the valley area. And then in 1901, when they built the, the dome at West Baden, I mean, the Mineral Springs is no competition to that and certainly isn't any competition to the French Lake Springs Hotel as well. But that failed attempt in the resort business didn't slow down the town's development. By that point, Paoli had built itself up with some manufacturing. Uh, there was a basket factory in Paoli. There was a lot of woodworking that occurred there. So Paoli had kind of diversified itself a little bit. The town never really had to exist on one thing. And French Lick and West Baden were much more tied to the tourism industry. Today, Paoli is a town of about 4,000, the largest in Orange County. And much like its neighbor Orleans, the heart of this small town is its town square. It is a Lancaster pattern square. The streets enter halfway on each side of the square. Some people say it's not a square, it's a circle because of course you circle around the square. And as you drive around the square or the circle, you're driving around one of the oldest, most distinctive courthouses in the state. What an amazing piece of architecture. It's the third courthouse to be built in Orange County. The first one was a log, the second one was stone. And then in 1850, they built the current courthouse. It's such an imposing building as it sits on the square and faces the south because the land slopes down towards the Lick Creek. They built it in the Greek Revival style, which was very popular in Antebellum America, and has these six Doric columns on the front, which is the simplest of all the Greek architectural orders. It's one of the few pre-Civil War courthouses left. A lot of people tore them down and built newer and more grand things. Judge Reese Rhodes is as responsible probably as anybody because he refused to move his court from that courtroom. And that really stirred up the preservation thing. But again, poverty has a way sometimes of preserving the past because people just don't have the money to do something new. And Orange County does have kind of a, a mentality of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that may have helped preserve it. And in 1947, Paoli's historic courthouse, along with the rest of the community, received national attention. Life wanted to do a spread on a typical Midwest town. It's a county seat. Of course, it has a beautiful courthouse in the middle of it. 
It's not a large town, but it's not a, a tiny little village kind of town either. It's somewhere in between. No one thinks of Southern Indiana having a ski resort. It's easy. Not that easy. Being at other ski resorts, you know, in the West or Northeast, you get a weird look, wondering how on earth you've managed that. I just need to look past. I have a seat. But Paoli Peaks has managed and thrived for more than three decades. And uh, we started with just one lift and three runs. And before that? Back in 77, it was just a farm. They'd raised hogs up on that hill. And so it's kind of interesting to think people are skiing down this, you know, it was once just pasture land and, and a hog operation. Paley Peaks has changed, but at the same time, it's still the same old ski resort that started in 1978. We've added some more runs, we've added more lifts, we have a great beginner area but it's still a good old resort at heart. Our typical guest is a beginner, or what we like to refer to sometimes as a never ever. In fact, some of our customers have never even seen snow before. We have many guests from Florida coming up, Nashville, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. They kind of use Paley Peaks as a transition resort. They come here, they learn. It's not as intimidating as a big mountain. We provide a reason to travel during the winter months. That helps a lot of local facilities. A lot of students get jobs there. I teach juniors and seniors. I would say that a good 10, 20% of my kids are gonna try to get a job there. Most years, Paoli Peaks is open from mid-December through mid-March. Obviously, it depends a little bit on the weather, but we've got some tools to help us out with that namely 110 snow machines that get quite a workout each season. If you compare us to out west, those resorts do have snowmaking, but not to the extent that we do. Um, we rely on our snowmaking. In ideal conditions, we can make 12 inches of snow in 24 hours. We try to focus on what we can control. Weather, unfortunately, we're working on it, but we can't control the weather yet. We've been doing snowmaking for years, since 1978. We have extensive knowledge and we've had many seasons where we've wondered, are we gonna get open or not? With proper planning, we can do it. I mean, we're really good meteorologists. <laughs> I personally think we could give any one of them a run for their money. Um, we're constantly studying the weather, long range forecasts, you know, making sure that we know when it's going to snow or if there's going to be a warm up or any of that. For more than 35 years, thanks to a lot of hard work, these southern Indiana peaks have been snow covered. So what does the future hold? As long as winter decides to show up, we'll be here skiing, snowboarding and snow tubing our customers. If you're up for some shopping after hitting the slopes, you might want to check out the French Lick Artisan Trail. Along the trail, you can sample award-winning wine at the French Lick Winery, feel the texture and the sculptures at Bear Hollow Woodcarvers, and if you head a few miles outside of West Baden, meet a family of artists who have called Orange County home for more than 30 years. This is Hinshaw Rock and Gems, a multi-generational journey that started with a rock collection and a trip to a rock shop. And the rock shop had a saw and a grinder. And my dad said to me, he says, I'd like to see what's in some of them rocks. And that's the day this business started. We knew of lapidary, but we had no idea what that word meant. A lapidary is an artisan, a cutter and polisher of stones. After cutting into those first rocks, it didn't take Merrill Hinshaw long to realize that with the help of his dad, he'd found his life's work. We started with the $150 investment for two machines. As the years gone by, we were able to upgrade by what we sold. While the financial capital came out of the business, the human capital came from the family, starting with Merrill's wife, Janice. 
We've been married 57 years. We started the business 53 years ago. I was very aggressive in the hunting. She was very supportive in allowing that to happen. Because for Merrill, the real joy was in the hunt. That was the main thing that kept me going to begin with. I'd spend probably two months every year doing nothing but hunting rocks. Finding rocks, that's easy. Finding museum quality agate or jasper, a bit more difficult. But Merrill compares it to something many Hoosiers can relate to, hunting morel mushrooms. Exactly the same thing. You learn what the morel looks like, and then you can find it. You learn what the different rocks are, and then you know. You will be walking through a field and you'll notice a rock that looks different than everything else. You go pick that one up and you look it over to see if it's anything that is usable. Don't ever turn down one that looks a little different because that's the one that maybe nobody has found yet. As time passed and the business grew, the Hinshaw family did a lot of rock hunting. We didn't go on vacations, we went on rock hunting trips. I, I didn't know what a vacation was. Uh, I thought a vacation was someplace you went to work away from home. Um, and that's what we did. The Hinshaws tried the wholesale route for a while. Focus on the hunting, let someone else worry about the rest. But Merrill's curiosity that developed at his father's side quickly got the better of him. That's the reason we started making the cuts and started doing the work is because you cannot appreciate the complete stone sometimes until you have seen it in its finished stage. After countless trips west and other stops along the way, the Hinshaws settled down on a 10-acre plot just outside of West Baden. Most of the lapidary work is handled by Matt, a skill passed down to a third generation. There are some general things that have to flow in a certain way, um, but then you add your own tweaks to it. You find it, you bring it home, put it in a saw. You cut it into slices, you look to see what there's good in it, and not every stone that you cut is gonna have something good in it. Then you mark out what you want, you cut it out with a trim saw, you would grind it with different stages of grinding wheels, and then you start to grind around top on it. I think I make it sound fairly easy, but it's about like breathing. I, I could almost cut a stone with my eyes closed. I, I don't think I'm gonna try that, but, but I could almost cut one with my eyes closed. A lot of these stones are cut to fit standard mounts, but the special ones are handed over to Merrill. With Dad's silver work, he can take any shape. I mean, literally any shape. You let the shape of the stone dictate the shape of the silver. That's all up to what that stone's kind of talking to you about. There's been a few get away from me that I couldn't find. When you stop and think about it, there may only have been 10 pieces and have someone already picked them up. I just was hooked by it. But without the support of your family, sometimes what you're doing is absolutely ludicrous. You just don't get no place. For me, it's heritage. And that's part of the fun of living somewhere and knowing your past. You're building on that. Spirit of Orange County to me would be the spirit of hospitality, the spirit of welcoming people to our area, which they've done for now close to 150 years. This is one of those places that just kind of soothes your soul. Kick back and relax and think about the past. I think the spirit of Orange County is its people. The people of this area who genuinely care about one another as neighbors and friends and family. We talk a lot about the buildings and the history of different parts of the community, but at the end, we always talk about what really makes a community. And of course, the answer is the people is what makes the town. The spirit of Orange County 
is the people of Orange County. Oh, when I'm dreaming, seems I'm somewhere. Sure, I'm so happy and skies are fair. Just like the place where I used to roam. In Indiana, my home sweet home. In Indiana, my home sweet home. In Indiana, I long to roam. Through your woods and hills and valleys wide. With my darling sweetheart by my side. Back with dear old dad and mother. You be more than any other in Indiana. For a DVD or Blu-ray disc of this program or other WTIU-produced programs, go online at shopwtiu.org. Production support for Spirit of Orange County is provided by Visit French Lick West Baden. Welcoming visitors of all ages to Orange County for activities including outdoor recreation, Indiana Artisan Wine, and world-renowned hospitality. Information on this and more at visitfrenchlickwestbaden.com. And by WTIU members, thank you.